com a Johanna é, Kolidhonen, que é responsável pelo Nostradamus Report. Vai. É um prazer receber você, Johanna, aqui com a gente hoje, ainda que virtualmente. É, para falar um pouquinho sobre o evento na né, edição de 2021, o tema que a gente vai abordar é a gestão do audiovisual e a sua importância cada vez mais latente diante do cenário, especialmente no mundo pós-pandemia. Né? A, 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 o quanto é fundamental que toda a cadeia produtiva da indústria audiovisual esteja de fato vista e contemplada e por isso a gente escolheu esse tema junto com a Alessandra Meleiro e a Débora Ivanov, que são as nossas curadoras convidadas para essa edição, que fizeram, a, construíram esse evento junto com a gente aqui. É, hoje a gente faz a Masterclass agora, na sequência de amanhã até sexta-feira, sempre às 17 horas, a gente tem as mesas de debate, e além disso, uma série de depoimentos que vão entrar no nosso canal do YouTube também, sempre tratando a questão da gestão em todos os seus aspectos, com figuras incríveis do audiovisual brasileiro, trazendo pontos de vista diversos e dividindo com a gente um pouco desse mundo que se desenrola agora, que vai começar a se desenrolar com mais força no pós-pandemia. Né? Então a gente já tinha um cenário no audiovisual é, que vinha crescendo com uma série de fatores, né? o mercado audiovisual passava por um momento de crescimento, mas também de muita dificuldade, e por isso, mais do que nunca, eh, todas essas discussões são fundamentais para a gente seguir. Então, agradeço, Johanna, por ter aceito o nosso convite, por estar aqui com a gente hoje, por dividir o, o resultado do nosso Tradamos Report com a gente, contar um pouquinho o que o futuro está reservando para a gente aí no campo do audiovisual, Gostaria de chamar a Alessandra, que vai fazer a condução junto com a Johanna desse nosso primeiro encontro, dessa Masterclass. Agradecer todo mundo que participou com a gente dessa construção e convidar todo mundo que está acompanhando a gente para não ficar somente hoje, mas seguir com a gente a semana toda nessas discussões. Obrigada, gente. Boa tarde bom evento. Obrigada, Ked, pela parceria, pela confiança é, em compartilhar essa curadoria com a gente. É, Johanna Kolyanen, thank you very much to be here with us, sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience. And só queria dar um recado para o público que é, essa, essa palestra vai ter tradução em libras e também quem quiser pode escolher é, ouvir pelo canal de tradução simultânea pelo YouTube. Então você pode escolher o, can o canal em português ou o canal em inglês. Bom, falar um pouquinho da trajetória da Johanna. É, ela tem uma trajetória uh, recente como analista do setor de mídia. Ela é designer de experiência e vem é, elaborando o relatório anual Nostradamus, que é lançado primeiramente no Festival de Gotemburgo. É, e na sequência nos mercados de Cannes e Berlim. Ela, enfim, circula internacionalmente dando palestras sobre essas impressões é, e essas conversas que ela tem com diversos profissionais de mídia. E também possui uma experiência no serviço público de radiodifusão da Suécia, é, principalmente no Swedish Film Institute. Em 2011, ela recebeu o Grande Prêmio Sueco de Jornalismo na categoria Inovação. So, Johanna, thank you. Now it's with you. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Thank you also, Kerti, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all so much for inviting me back to Brazil. I'm, I'm very sad, of course, that I can't be there in person. I'm here today to speak based on the eighth annual Nostradamus report on the near future of the screen industries. And I will speak today for maybe 80 minutes. So do take advantage of being able to move around and stretch while you listen. Let's see if I can share my screen. All right. Yes, that looks right. 
Nostradamus is a project uh, by the Nordic Film Market. In addition to the report, we produce annual seminars here in Sweden, in Göteborg at the Film Festival, and also at the international film markets in Cannes and Berlin. The Nostradamus project is a collaboration with uh, Film Ivest, which is an important regional fund. They are also our main partner. And our other supporters are public as well. Because our perspective uh, into the future is three to five years, the three last or so reports tend to be relatively up to date and you can download them for free at this web address on the screen. The latest report is from February of this year. It's called Transforming Storytelling Together. And much like the previous one, it is actually surprisingly hopeful. And I mentioned this now at the start because I will talk about some massive challenges today. In fact, if you happened to hear me speak in Sao Paulo two years ago, uh, some of what I have to say will sound familiar. The events since then have unfortunately confirmed uh, what was then still hypothetical concerns. It turns out, unfortunately, that we were right. But on the other hand, we have experienced positive changes. Well, there is hope. And actually, last year's report is hopeful too. So you should read that as well. What I'm hoping to do today is to paint a picture of some ongoing trends in the audiovisual sector. We are all of us in an exceptional situation of structural change and transition, a situation that has only been accelerated by the pandemic. But even among these exceptional situations, Brazil's situation is special, not just because it is worse, although of course it is absolutely terrible, but because many of your experiences now will be shared at least in part, in many other countries in the coming decade. You are already living inside of the problems of the future. And this means that you can also be pioneers of the solutions of the future. Given the exciting, flourishing and, and the international impact of Brazilian film in the last five years or so, I suspect that in fact you already are pioneering the future. And obviously I can't tell you anything about film in Brazil that you don't already know. But I hope uh, that this wider image that I'm trying to paint today can encourage you to continue on that path so that we can all learn from you. My talk today has three sections. First, uh, a look at the most urgent macro level situation, then talking about the changes in the global film industry specifically, and especially thinking about how the position of this industry exactly on the border between the arts and commercial media might be hindering us from finding new paths. And I will reflect a little bit on some of the consequences we can already foresee and finally give you some examples of how to think about looking for new ways of working. We also have time for questions and I'm happy then to speak about any specific uh, issues that might be on your mind. So let's start at the biggest level. The Estonian film futurist Stan Saluver once told me that when he was working on his PhD, he looked into this idea of crisis in the film industry. When does the narrative about our being in crisis start? And the answer he found was in the 1920s. We are storytellers in this industry. And the story that we tell about ourselves has for the last, last hundred years been that we are always in crisis. This makes it difficult sometimes for outsiders and honestly also for ourselves to compare the relative levels of crisis. So let's just start there. Right now, the global industry is in, perhaps exiting, an urgent crisis of production and an urgent crisis of screening caused by the global pandemic. At the same time, also on the top level, we have in many countries also a crisis of funding because public money has been reduced, redirected, delayed, canceled, and also because certain streams of private financing are less available while the window system is shifting. But some of that money might be coming back. 
in fact, I think quite a lot of it. Underneath this top crisis, if we go back to 2019, before the pandemic, the global audiovisual industry is in an incredible boom, a boom of production that still continues. And this is, of course, also familiar in your market. There is great demand of serialized content. Streamers and TV companies are putting record levels of money even into feature film production. Global companies among these are increasingly invested in local content and national production. And we as an industry have never produced more content, more hours of film. Studios are full. And in many countries, all the available crew are booked at all times. The Brazilian funding crisis predates the pandemic by about a year, but looking back, for instance, at the 13 Brazilian features at the Berlinale last year and at the production investments from the streamers, it looks to me like you were in this boom trajectory, just like everybody else. And without that, the situation right now would be even worse. That's the middle. Underneath the global production boom, for everyone are then the structural and economic changes caused by the digitalization of the cinematic value chain. Do remember that when the pandemic started, every step of the value chain and all of the windows of the media chronology after the theatrical release had already transformed. What each window is worth, what the holdback times were, how the audience behaved, this was already changing. And even before the pandemic, everyone already knew that the exclusive theatrical premiere window would not be available for all films anymore because we were making too many films for the available screens and also for the amount of the current audiences. What we didn't know then and are still finding out is what that change would look like, what other ways of releasing might work, and of course, whether new audiences might also be attracted. This tension inside our industry between crisis and opportunity, what we can learn from that and why it makes us so uncomfortable is what I will talk about today. But before I do, unfortunately, I have to add one more level of crisis, because while it has been overshadowed in the news by the pandemic this last year, there is something else that will shape our industry and every industry for the rest of our lives. The latest report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was released this month. And the science is now very clear. Climate change is real, it is man-made, and it is occurring faster than expected. We now know that this is not a theoretical problem. It's not a problem for the future or for our children. This is happening today in every region of the world. We as a species, have approximately 10 years to change how all of our global systems uh, and national systems of production, trade and infrastructure operate. Every industry must be part of this change towards sustainability and resilience. But even if we didn't have to, cinema will still be changed by this emergency and by the changes that will be needed to address it. We, we as humans are not great at thinking ahead. We live our lives expecting that tomorrow will be approximately like today, and that works until it doesn't. Most days are similar to yesterday, but sometimes everything changes very gradually so that day by day, we might not notice that it's happening. And on some days, everything really does change all at once. And then we are surprised not because we didn't think it would happen, but because we didn't know when, and therefore we did not prepare. Just like we were also not prepared for a global pandemic, even though scientists have told us for decades that one would inevitably come. While the news were full of our struggles with the pandemic, we have also experienced devastating weather events in places as different as Texas, Germany, Turkey, Haiti. Nowhere is safe from extreme cold, extreme heat, drought, flooding. Whether your country is rich or poor, 
your country's infrastructure was built for its specific climate. And when it gets much warmer than usual, or colder, or wetter, or drier, we are not prepared. The central tragedy here, of course, is it, it, that it's the, the weakest and poorest humans uh, in the world, and also inside our own countries, who will disproportionately suffer and die. But as we have also learned this year, a global crisis, any global crisis, is not some kind of theoretical humanitarian tragedy that we, as functionally middle-class producers, producers of culture, can somehow exist outside of. This image of the empty cinema is a visual icon of the global pandemic, but it's also a reminder of what we all learned in this last year, that even though what we make is abstracted, art, images, dreams, ideas, emotions, this industry is located very firmly in the real world. And in very practical ways, we are constantly affected by the political, social, and financial systems that surround us. So when they change, we must change. If the seasons of snow and rain and heat don't follow their usual times, filming becomes impossible to plan. If there are forest fires or floods in a region of Sweden, or as happens, or a region of Brazil, as I think also happens, then we cannot shoot there. If there are riots in the streets, cinemas will close. And even this pandemic, which we will be living with for perhaps years yet, affecting travel and trade, it will not be the last pandemic of our lifetime. These last two years for this industry in general, and for the Brazilian industry in particular, have been an exercise in living with crisis. And the world that we are hopefully returning to soon is still and will continue to be unstable. We will continue to live in a crisis, perhaps always. So we have to be more resilient and we have to be part of the solutions, not the problems. Professional cultural production, and certainly working in audiovisual media, is historically a middle-class pursuit. It's speaking largely to a middle-class audience, which pays for it, either in a commercial marketplace or indirectly through the taxis. Arguably, the relative stability of the middle classes is the engine of the global economy as a whole. And right now, because of climate change, even food production systems are threatened all over the world. Now, first, of course, this affects the safety and the survival of the poor, including subsistence farmers. And that's already happened. But it also makes the global economy more unpredictable, affecting everyone. And the political consequences are very unpredictable too. Certainly, we will see more hunger, wars, civil unrest, epidemics. Now, the entertainment industry, especially TV and film, is actually relatively resistant to global economic problems because seeing film is affordable to many people. But this only goes so far. As you know, even in Brazil, film is not available to everyone, certainly not in the theaters. So volatile economies and the social unrest will always affect our markets. In addition, there is this challenge now that in many countries, as you know, we are electing populists. And typically they do not believe in science, which escalates the climate emergency. And this is in itself a nightmare, but also as an immediate consequence for film, populists in power tend to cut arts funding or to control it, either through direct censorship or through a culture of fear. Almost, almost regardless who is in power, when countries and economies are in crisis, public funding for the arts is always under threat. This can absolutely happen, even in countries that are quite stable, such as the Nordic countries. In fact, during the pandemic, Sweden supported the arts quite generously, while a very, very similar government in Finland, the neighboring country, left the entire culture sector by the wayside. Now, of course, 
we must keep fighting for the necessity and value of public funding for filmmaking and for the other arts. But even for a sympathetic government, it might not always be possible politically or financially to deliver that support. And personally, I do believe that in the long term, supporting the arts is a question of life and death for humans and for democracy. But I also understand that in the short term, emergencies can take precedence. So this leads us to my first question of tonight. What if our public film funding disappears never to return? This is not my preferred outcome. But in all countries where our film industries rely on public money, we must ask ourselves this question bravely. Here in Sweden right now, it seems theoretical, but it could be very real in just two elections. That's within five years. In Brazil, it's an ur urgent question right now. And, and we all wish for, and we all should argue for policy changes that would unlock these funds for you, no matter who is in charge. But I think we also need to be intellectually honest enough to say that cannot be our only plan. So what if public film funding is gone? Then what would it take to keep making film? And where could those resources come from? We talk about this in boardrooms. And today I thought that maybe we should be asking the screenwriters, actually, they are trained in creating plausible narratives from hypothetical situations. They might have better solutions sometimes than producers do. Now, let me dig into some overall market trends. And again, if you would like to read in more technical detail about these things, I refer you to the Nostradamus report. If we consider the overall value chain of film production, it has more or less this shape. As you know, a film idea finds traction with producers and financiers, and it gets made, it gets sold and distributed, possibly it gets a theatrical premiere, and then it ends up through different paths in our living rooms. And this is all still true, but because the traditional single path of the window chronology has transformed into a number of different paths to market, we should probably start thinking about it like this and move sales and distribution up the value chain. How and where the film will be distributed determines how it will be monetized. And that means that putting together financing requires you to make the distribution decisions very early. This has always been true, but when there was just one answer, you didn't have to do an active choice, right? The trend we've been seeing in the last several years is that sales and distribution don't provide enough value for you or for themselves only as middlemen. So instead, those companies are spreading out along the value chain. Many like to come in early with investment because having ownership is one way for a sales or distribution company to make their own business work especially for niche content. And in fact, we have seen distribution companies transform into production companies quite successfully. At the same time, sales and distribution also moves downstream, perhaps becoming aggregators or investing in their own theaters or streaming platforms. And of course, the streamers are producing original content as well, just like the broadcasters always have. Completed films can still be sold, especially to additional platforms or territories. And, and big streamers do also like to buy a complete, completed product when they can. We've especially seen this during the pandemic. Because of course, buying a finished film is a less risky investment when they know what they are paying for. But more typically, they too will need to come in early just because there's such competition for projects right now. And for you, as a producer, to balance risk and funding and to be able to work proactively with placing the work uh, in front of an audience, you will, it will probably require uh, a pretty detailed audience strategy already at the script stage. This is true for arthouse films just as much as for a commercial comedy. 
in the old reality, theoretically, we could make a film first and then let somebody else worry about selling it. But in the new value chain, getting financing always depends on understanding who your audience is and where they are. Older, and I think older can be anybody who's older than me, older auteur uh, directors in particular do find this idea very uncomfortable of thinking about selling already at the start. In some countries, public film funds were originally conceptualized as existing to protect the artist and to protect the artistic process from the demands of popular opinion. And we all know that there have been filmmakers in the world whose primary audience was festival selection committees and film commissioners in charge of selective funding. Secondarily, perhaps a few hundred thousand individuals you know, in the world, cineasts who had the exact same taste. It has been possible historically for a film artist to scrape by with a relatively small audience as long as it was the right kind of people. But at the same time, uh, I think we also all agree that our greatest filmmakers, like here in Sweden, Ingmar Bergman or, or Ruben Östlund, or in Finland, where I'm from, Aki Kaurismäki, who the pictures uh, is from one of his films, they are important because, yes, they make award-winning A-Festival films, but those films also speak to a, a somewhat broader audience. These films are great, but also relevant. Now, you could argue that we actually haven't had just one global film industry for the last hundred years. We had two. We had a commercial industry where films are developed to the taste of the broadest possible market. And we have an artistic industry where films are developed to the taste of a niche market or even to the taste of the author themselves. And for historical reasons, if you worked in, in one of these systems, you often viewed the other with some alienation and anxiety. I'm over 40. And in the system of cultural value that I was raised in, a core quality of real art was that not everybody had to understand it or care for it. But this duality has also always been a simplification. It feels to me like every time there is an aesthetic revolution, it involves renegotiating these boundaries of what has artistic value, at least in the previous generation. The French New Wave made it part of its aesthetic project and its intellectual project to rehabilitate as artists um, great entertainers like Alfred Hitchcock and Billy Wilder. And now we consider them to be masters of cinema. In the 1990s, global indie filmmakers were also deconstructing um, exploitation cinema and video aesthetics and, and other things. And this anxiety between commercial value and aesthetic or cultural value becomes even more complicated in smaller language areas or in developing economies where public support has been necessary even to make commercial films possible. And if that funding is selective, inevitably every film will be somewhere between the commercial and the artistic, because in most countries, the public money does not actually have exclusively artistic goals. In post-war Europe, public film funding was often quite explicitly part of a strategy of resistance against American cultural imperialism. Today, we would be using different words. Uh, of course, for instance, we might say that the goal of funding is to make sure uh, that our local perspectives and stories and language are available to us, to the citizens, a broad audience, also in cinematic form. And this picture is from Pleasure, a feature debut by Swedish director Ninja Tyberi about a young woman who is trying to uh, succeed in the US pornography industry. The film was a con selection last year, and Tuberi is very much a highbrow filmmaker, but she also wants her films to be seen by as many people as possible. This film has a titillating subject, and it is filmed mostly in English, but I would argue that it does deliver on this artistic and local value that is the goal of public funding in Sweden. It, the film has a contemporary Swedish perspective, exploring the colonization, and the commodification 
of our morals, uh, of our bodies and of our sexualities by a North American hyper-capitalist aesthetic. Now, will this film connect both with the intellectual art house audience and with young mainstream viewers? I don't know yet because we had a pandemic, but we will see this fall. I recently heard a podcast that totally blew my mind. Uh, it observed that Generation Z, the people who are under 25, they don't even have a concept for selling out. To them, of course, some sources of funding are not ethical. Some companies, some governments don't work with them. But to them, there's nothing wrong about having access to money in itself. It doesn't make you less of an artist and neither does expressing yourself in a popular discourse. And as I listened to this, I, I suddenly realized how much of this anxiety about commercial and artistic value still shapes how we older people feel and speak in this industry as we react to the current crisis that we are in. And especially perhaps there is the anxiety about the impact of global companies. Now, I was reading earlier about your uh, Mostra festival, uh, which unfortunately I haven't been able to visit yet, but give me time. And it really made me smile because in Helsinki in the 1990s, in the most distant armpit of Europe, I went to film festivals much smaller that screened the exact same films that you would have seen there. Our film revolution was an indie revolution. And the whole point was to empower more voices, to tell more diverse stories with new cheap filmmaking technology in opposition to predictable Hollywood blockbusters. And in opposition to the incredible fakeness of almost every program on TV at that time. Now, I think our analysis back then of the mainstream film industry was correct. But what we sometimes forget is that now we are the establishment. Our values from the 90s really did win because we were right. The popular audience is not stupid. And when people have more TV and film to choose from, they will often, often select content that surprises them and challenges them at least a little. And at the same time, it is also over 30 years since David Lynch and filmmakers of his caliber first started creating serious work for a broad audience on commercial network television. And actually, both academic analysis and critical reception demonstrate that the quality of mainstream TV and the narrative complexity of mainstream TV has risen significantly since then. And this is also true for commercial film. In this last decade, even the most commercial companies in the world making the most commercial billion dollar movies are now specifically recruiting art house filmmakers to direct and to write. They are working with serious actors and even telling morally complicated stories, at least, you know, by the standards of the US mainstream. Yes, the global theatrical dominance of the blockbuster movie is a challenge for all of us everywhere else. But this does not just reflect commercial power structures. Part of the reason why these films are successful is that commercial entertainment has become qualitatively better since I was a child. TV is pretty great too, <laughs> and that's why we all watch it and why many of us make it. And this is in itself a great source of hope because it means that there is also an audience for auteur film beyond the festival circuit. In particular, of course, films that reimagines or explores elements from familiar commercial genres. Even when things were good, um, getting a film financed was difficult and exhausting. And this idea that we have to relearn how to do this and relearn the audiovisual landscape and take an interest in new technologies and champion new voices, maybe while also competing with the entire commercial marketplace in the commercial marketplace. Yes, this can make us very tired. It is also human 
to react with fear to change. But the fear of change, being afraid of things changing, is far more dangerous than the change itself. During the pandemic, some people on the internet started to talk about how when we all get out of lockdown, it will be like the roaring 20s. And I personally like that fantasy a lot. I felt that in the 1920s, I would have been in maybe Josephine Baker or Zelda Fitzgerald, somebody very cool and young and innovative and iconic. Or at least I would be like a cool flapper girl dancing to dangerous music. But then, unfortunately, I realized that a hundred years ago, I would have been born in 1878. I would be the middle-aged lady in this picture with my corset and my hat, trying to understand what the heck are these young people doing. I would be scornful of modernism. I would be dismissive of jazz. I would assume that young people are immoral and also idiots with no sense of history or culture. So I try to remember this when I catch myself in my heart complaining about the audience liking the wrong things. And in particular, when I, when I hear myself think that kids these days don't understand what's good or that their media are loud and fast and incomprehensible and also super annoying. When we ask ourselves about the audience, why don't they just? Why don't people just do the th like things like we wanted them to? Why don't they just behave like they did before so that I can go on making a living? That's when we have to remember that we are the Victorian lady in this picture. And those jazz kids who are doing everything wrong, they have invented modernity. And a hundred years later, we will say that when they did everything wrong, they created all of the things that we consider to be right. So let's not be the kind of people who dismiss everything we don't yet understand. And let's not underestimate the taste and skill of young audiences. Okay, now we are ready to talk about the window system. The commercial film industry in particular is experiencing a screening crisis right now because audience behaviors have changed. So the power balance between the studios and the exhibitors has also changed and the theatrical window needs to be negotiated so that, this, uh, so that it reflects it. What role theatrical exhibition will play for any single release is also shifting. Uh, and the, the current conflicts about holdbacks and about contracts are ultimately about the balance between what will be earned in the cinemas and what will be earned in premium uh, streaming. But I don't know if you've read about Scarlett Johansson's uh, fight with Disney about Black Widow, but let's be clear, that fight is not about premium streaming at home being a problem. That film is actually quite profitable. Her problem is that her contract, her contract personally, did not reflect the present landscape. And if any of you are currently in a contract with a major studio for tens of millions of dollars, Yes, please go back right now and check the language and see that it reflects a realistic business model for today. However, most of us don't make blockbuster movies, but it's still important for all of us that an agreement is found about revenue share and exclusivity in movie theaters. Because these international blockbusters and our own domestic hit movies, these are central to the management of risk and profit in the mainstream cinemas. And if we want a mainstream audience for film at scale, we need those screens. We need more of them. And I am actually not worried at all about the future of the exhibition industry. Everyone is making very dramatic statements right now. Of course they are. They're in negotiations. They have to, to paint the bleakest possible picture. But commercial cinema screening will continue to be profitable both for the rights holders and for the exhibitors, just in some slightly new way. 
for niche and local uh, and uh, auteur types of film, the screening crisis that we also have is slightly different. Our main problem is that the audience behavior is changing because some films don't actually need the theatrical screening to be enjoyed. And that's a problem for us, since such a big share of the income has historically been from theaters. And now before you get angry with me, let me be clear, many kinds of films still work best in theaters. And we must remember that global box office uh, actually hit a record high in 2019, thanks in, in, in large part to growth uh, in countries like Brazil. In many other markets, however, cinemas have been struggling a bit. But even in those places, interestingly, art house cinemas and neighborhood cinemas have often performed better than the rest of the market. So apparently it's not that audiences don't love going to the cinema, but they respond very well to programming that is curated for them locally by people who understand both the audience and which films to program for that audience. And in the last few years, a number of art house films have broken through to bigger numbers, to mainstream audiences and to young viewers, Parasite being the obvious example. And this can happen when the content is relevant, uh, when it's of a high quality, and when the distributors really understand both the work and how to communicate that work. Now, what kinds of films will do well in cinemas in the future is a topic for the next Nostradamus report. So this is preliminary stuff. But my current hypothesis is that these four qualities uh, are, are key. A cinematic film, a theatrical film, needs to have an element of spectacle. It needs to have an elevated aesthetic. It needs to have some kind of physical bodily reaction from the viewer. It can be laughter or tears or discomfort or, or, or terror. And for the ability to start a conversation. Now, if you have three of these, I think you should try for a theatrical release. If you have four, like Parasite, go big. But sometimes when our films are not performing well, we, maybe we're scared to analyze why. And then it becomes easier to say that, oh, it's because Netflix or Disney Plus are ruining the art of cinema by making films available at home. When we all know film is best in a theater. That's nonsense. I mean, yes, it's great. But even we who work in the film industry, we watch films in our own living rooms all the time. And we have done so for half a century. We watched films on TV. We watched films on VHS in terrible quality. We watched films on DVD, on Blu-ray. And we, we never said, oh, DVDs are ruining the art of cinema back when we were making tons of money selling DVDs. No, the real problem with streamers is that we don't trust them. We don't trust that we will be paid fairly if we don't have access to the audience numbers. And that is a very valid concern. And here, actually, now I have a little bit of good news, probably. It's like a good news gossip. There is such competition right now for talent and for stories that people are saying that it's, it is increasingly possible to negotiate a different streaming deal than the standard deal. There are signals that even Netflix is sharing more data with the filmmakers. So don't forget to make demands and also requests, but especially demands, when you are dealing with them, it might work. And in these negotiations, by the way, don't be alone. Locally and globally, our unions and our industry organizations should also pay a part in setting standards. And so should the public bodies who are providing production incentives because they might be in a stronger position to make demands. A more emotional thing to handle about the streamers is that many in our industry are afraid that it's not just our income, but also our status as artists that will suffer if our work does not get the theatrical release. And in the old system, that would have been true, but times are changing and the status systems and norms around cultural change value are, are changing too. What we need is to get compensated fairly not based on what a film was worth in a market that no longer exists, in front of an audience that no longer exists, 
we, we will never have that. So don't ask for that. We need a fair compensation based on what the film is worth today and in the years to come. And nobody quite knows right now what that is. So we all, all of us, need to formulate an idea of how we think that the value chains actually work today and how they should work. Five years from now, probably we will have fewer cinemas like the ones we have today. And they will be divided by their programming into mostly blockbuster theaters and into other types of art house or community cinemas. Films may still have a short exclusive theatrical window, perhaps two or three weeks. There will also be a premium, more expensive digital window just after the premiere, sometimes in parallel, sometimes even before the theatrical premiere, when that makes sense. What will definitely have disappeared is that dead window when the film isn't available anywhere. And actually, this means that you will only have to market each film once. And for most of the titles, this is a win-win development. In addition to blockbuster cinemas, there will also be, be profitable bourgeois upmarket cinemas aimed at people who can afford to spend some money on a cultural night out. And in both of these kinds of cinemas, but especially the latter, there is definitely room for some art house film on the program. But one of the major predictions in this year's report was actually that in addition to these two kinds of cinema, there is the possibility of a kind of cinema renaissance the pandemic has forced a lot of cinemas to close, making cinema real estate more affordable and, and available for more experimental exhibition. I actually heard last week that you have a good example right here uh, in Sao Paulo. Some venues of this new kind will innovate entirely new offers and other will be quite similar to successful neighborhood or, or community cinemas today. Art house film, niche titles, catalog titles will mix with other cultural activities like concerts and gaming, film festivals and curated pop-ups and hybrid events will blossom. These venues can absolutely be viable businesses and I believe that they can revitalize film culture in the public sphere. But even they can probably not sustain an exhibition market for the volumes of independent cinema that have been re released in the past theatrically. So if you have a film that is not obviously commercial, uh, it will need some kind of non-traditional release. And if it, has, if it doesn't have three of those four qualities, maybe it should only have a, a very small release. And in any such situation, a, a limited theatrical premiere or even a tour of the film with talent can be very important but that will only be part of your release strategy. It is of vital importance that we don't give up on the under 25s as cinema goers and that we don't give, uh, give up on them as audiences for qualitative film, because that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy very fast. If traditional exhibition cannot provide to these younger viewers relevant films in appealing environments at an affordable price point, then the younger generation will move on to other things and never come back. But if we do offer those things, or, and, or, if we empower the young people to recreate theatrical exhibition for their own generation, then I believe the theatrical window and the movie going experience and the income from that can still continue very strongly. Beyond cinemas then, the production boom that I was talking about at the start is still ongoing. And it's driven by the number of, of local and global streaming services that are trying to establish themselves at the same time. In five years, there won't be much distinction between streaming and TV. The US and the Chinese majors and tech giants will continue their global domination. Uh, streamers will probably replace what used to be pay TV. I think we will probably have slightly fewer US companies because there will be mergers. And of course, the regional giants like a Global Play or a Filmin or a Via Play will certainly still have a significant role. 
this new TV system, uh, TV ecosystem will be much like the old one, uh, but on demand and better funded. And it's not going to be just subscriptions. We can see that advertising funded VOD is growing and also reaching new audiences. So it's growing the total audience. And not all of this content will be exclusive, but all of these platforms will need content, uh, episodic and films and formats that don't even have names yet. And because the big screen will not be available for all feature films, at least not in wide releases, this means that the financial heart of the film industry is going to be the small screen. And in fact, probably also the artistic heart. And this is difficult to accept if you are my age or older and your status is invested in the traditional film industry, but we have to work out our emotions because we know that since decades now, the living room screen is not just a populist distraction. It is a gift to film artists who want to have an impact in the world. So let's summarize now what we have covered so far. Five years from now, instead of one typical release pattern for film or one typical business model, ownership will be distributed differently among the stakeholders. And the audience attention will be monetized in many different ways. Now, what exact shapes film releasing will take next, that will be determined right now, in the next three years, through innovation all along the value chain. And that's just really a fancy way of saying that the choices that you make in the next few years, they really matter now. Those who do not participate in creating new solutions, in renegotiating old ways of financing and of working. Those who don't participate in testing new models, anyone who tries just to do what they always did before will have the outcomes dictated to them by the most powerful stakeholders. So literally every one of us needs now to think about what kinds of film industry we all think would be good and fair and also likely to succeed. All the living room platforms, yeah, they need some exclusive content to be competitive, but they will need non-exclusive content rights too. They will often try to buy all the rights just in case, in case you give them up, but they don't always need them and you might be able to carve some out. A limited theatrical release might be profitable for you while also marketing the asset for the platform. That's a win-win, makes it easier to negotiate. Or if your film has a very specific audience that you know really well, you might try to retain transactional VOD rights. Especially in the US, documentary filmmakers have done surprisingly well even selling direct downloads from their own websites, which sounds crazy to me, but it's true. And the reason is that you keep such a big cut of every transaction. But it's, even if you do well, it's still at scales that are relatively small and they don't compete actually with the subscription services. Another pre-existing trend that accelerated further during the pandemic was the international impact of, of uh, non-US content. Companies like Netflix they aim for global dominance, so they need content from every market. And to be able to afford this, business logic dictates that that content then also needs to be viewed in other countries as well. And this was of course, especially true when production shut down in so many countries for so long. You may have noticed your catalogs became more valuable. Now we are seeing non-English content marketed aggressively on the platforms and we're seeing serious investment in dubbing and in subtitling. And international audiences are actually responding really well. U.S. viewers, they still prefer U.S. content, but that's only natural since that is their local content. But even for U.S. Uh, companies, the home market is no longer the biggest. Their biggest market is the rest of us. So we used to have Hollywood majors and local cinema. Now every piece of content is potentially international, if it's relevant to the contemporary moment, and if it's told in a fresh, and engaging and artistically compelling manner. 
I also hope we will see more international collaboration between smaller stakeholders like public service broadcasters or, or niche streamers, because together they can scale up their commissioning and licensing power. And I was actually watching a, Bra a Brazilian film yesterday on, on my local art house streaming service, and I noticed uh, this wonderful movie about the werewolves. And uh, I, I noticed a fair deal of international TV and streamer logos at the start, so maybe there's hope for this, actually. But I have to say something uh, serious about co-production and co-financing, because on the one hand, the increasing ability of content to travel really does make co-production more attractive to all parties going forward. And the talent and the stories and locations and the crews of another country are practically valuable, not just for some diversity goal. We need them. But on the other hand, Remember how I said before that public funding might be diminishing unpredictably in many countries in the future. If the available resources shrink, then co-production and co-financing will become even more important, but likely it will also become harder to access because there will be less of it. But just like now, if you can reliably deliver an audience in your own country, it's immediately more interesting. Um, so again, no matter how, how, how you fund your work, we keep bumping up against this idea that the work really has to be relevant to the audience. Okay, production. Another massive change accelerated by the pandemic was virtual production. And if you don't know very much about it, there is a short and practical introduction in the Nostradamus report. But basically this is uh, any kind of filmmaking using live 3D modeling usually produced in a kind of software called a game engine. The most expensive kind of virtual production is what was made famous by Disney's Mandalorian. The whole landscape was generated on LED walls in a studio and captured live in camera. But there are also many kinds of fully virtual productions, including animation. And in those, the virtual landscape exists only inside the computer, either with virtual performers or with green screen performances. And because this virtual room is rendered in real time, like a computer game, it can be captured by a human cinematographer controlling a virtual camera while moving in a physical room. Any room, actually, you can do it at home. Your DP can work remote. Five years from now, virtual production methods and tools and pipelines will have completely normalized in our industry. You will probably be using them for pre-visualization, probably also for effects and location work. And if you're in animation, you're probably using them already. These new production pipelines will save you money and time. They will give you more creative control and they will enable even relatively small markets or even individuals to make work with a lot of VFX or to make big animation in a way that would have required Disney-type resources just 10 years ago or five years ago even. I grew up in Finland. My country has a population of 5 million. Sweden has 10. It has never been feasible for us to make expensive kinds of movies like big action or, or genre pieces because the market cannot support it. And the public funds are too limited. These technologies will change that. And consider what it means for a film industry like yours, with a language as big as yours and a talent pool as deep as yours. If we want to make films that are meaningful and qualitative, but also appeal to wide audiences, being able to work with any kind of visual is a complete game changer. This is also completely changing what zero budget or, or low budget filmmaking looks like, because the technologies are getting cheaper too. Most film schools don't even teach virtual production yet. So even the professionals are, are, are learning from each other and from YouTube tutorials. A great place to begin is Matt Workman. Uh, he has a channel on YouTube called Cinematography Database. Warm recommendation. And if you want to get started with these tools, you'll need a powerful computer, like a gaming computer. But then beyond that, good tools and, and licenses range from free to some hundreds or maybe a few thousands of dollars, and then you are at professional quality. Now, this means two things. First, professional filmmakers on limited budgets can make very impressive work. 
that was, of course, in a way already true with digital cameras and editing equipment and LED lights, but now the sky is the limit. Second, impressive filmmakers who are not professionals, but who have taken the time to learn and practice and actually make their own films for months, you know, and years, they can now make work that looks professional. And this is totally different from amateur video when I was a child, because now you can also distribute your work yourself on creator to consumer platforms like YouTube and Vimeo and TikTok. And people do. Some do it because they are trying to get noticed by the established industry. And some are trying to build audiences for projects and IPs that they are developing. And some just go directly to market. Non-traditional creators and collectives are establishing a parallel professional audiovisual storytelling market outside of the traditional industry. Um, and even people working low-level jobs inside our industry are often doing this on the side instead of waiting for someone, you know, some gatekeeper to give them permission to make movies. I think we have a lot to learn here. In practice, these clusters often become independent production companies and they fund their work through a cut of the advertising, through making commercial collaborations, and through direct payments from the viewers. And sometimes, yeah, often, most often, that's not enough to live on, but at least they have very impressive portfolios when they look for work with us, and we should catch them while we can, because people with virtual production skills are basically guaranteed well-paying jobs for many, many years to come, either with us or, or with the video game industry. If you would like to see one example uh, of an unconventional film career, you could take a look at someone like Haz Dulol, uh, a British director who came from VFX and established himself as a guerrilla filmmaker. He directed something for Disney in between, uh, but then spent the pandemic making a feature length animation film with virtual production tools with basically a five person remote working team. His company is called Has Film. Uh, and there's an episode on the Future of Film podcast where he describes the workflow that he is using now. And that's actually a really good podcast with, uh, if you want to hear other interviews with filmmakers who are on unconventional paths. It concerns me how many of us in the film industry are, are blind to changes in art artistic practice. I'm constantly surprised by how formats that used to be totally marginal or that from the perspective of the traditional industry are hybrids, how incredibly well they are doing. Animated films and series for grown-ups, often dramas or dramedies, is now a multi-billion dollar sector because in animation, unestablished artists and writers and directors who have relevant stories to tell can reach enormous audiences and they can be profitable while also retaining a lot of creative control. In drama, A-list auteur filmmakers are making series for TV, you know, virtual reality has really taken a leap in the last year. Maybe you're not even listening anymore because you are thinking that knowing about some animated drama series on TV is totally irrelevant to your kind of filmmaking. I get that. But remember, maybe you are a Victorian lady. And these audiences are not necessarily children. In fact, they're definitely not children. If your target audience is 45 year olds who love world cinema, but those same people are also watching Bojack Horseman, then there is something here that resonates. So we've said now that there's never been more audiovisual production than in the last five years and never more feature films either. And even at this time, even in the countries like, in, like the Nordics, uh, where the financing has been, been stable, we are struggling to make films that the domestic audiences actually want to see. And you know, the industry, we always find someone to blame. Oh, we say the problem is streaming or the problem is that we have too little money. Or the problem is these distributors who do not know how to market our films. Or the problem is the audience who just don't care. And okay, actually, to be fair, distributors do need to catch up on, on how other, all other industries are working with marketing. But let's be real. If Swedish filmmakers, with all of their talent and experience and funding, cannot make a film a success with the audience, that's not anybody else's fault. Either the films are bad or the films are not relevant enough. 
This image is from an opposite example, uh, a Danish auteur film called One More Round. It was a massive audience success. It actually also did well at the Oscars. This film is about Nordic alcohol culture and, and also about how when we become middle-aged, uh, we humans often lose track of ourselves and of our dreams. It's a very good film. Uh, the star, Mads Mikkelsen, is an excellent actor and he has mainstream recognition. He's been in Bond movies. Yet this is thematically relevant uh, to almost all of, our, our all of the grown-ups in our region. And you know what? Even during the pandemic, people showed up in the cinemas to see this film. And every Nordic filmmaker who has ever said, oh, people just don't go to the movies anymore. They have to think about what the success of this film Prok, means because people still go when they care. Traditional cinema has a relevance problem. And this, by the way, is also why we need to tell more diverse stories, to work with younger storytellers, perhaps on completely new platforms, and to really listen to our audiences. And if that feels uncomfortable, then I must ask you, Can you describe for me the final incarnation of the feature film? Have we perfected cinema? Okay, what is the formula for the relevant, timely, meaningful feature? If we have perfected cinema, we can choose to take the museum path. We can say that cinema is like opera. It is an art form that is largely completed and it must be maintained in its current state, even though that means our audiences will mostly be older members of the cultural elites. And even though that means that new productions will mostly look back to the history of film and not towards the world and towards the age in which we live. We can make that choice. But if we believe that film art can still reach new heights, well, then it must follow that renewal is happening somewhere. Artistic new renewal, new storytellers, new formats, new audiovisual languages. Naturally, always in interaction with the history of cinema. I'm personally certain that this renewal is happening, but only partly within the scope of the traditional film industry. Now, what we all want going forward is a sustainable film industry. Environmentally sustainable, of course, but also socially, financially, artistically sustainable. This means that the industry has to be available to pe for people of all backgrounds, because we need everyone so that we can tell stories to everyone. We have to be able to work in this industry with dignity, we need reasonable pay. We need to work without harassment, respected as artists, as craftspeople, and as humans. We have to redesign our paths to market. We have to think radically about lowering production costs by employing the latest technology where needed. And we need to make those affordable productions look fantastic by consistently working with experienced masters of traditional filmmaking disciplines, such as lighting and cinematography. And most importantly, we need to make films that are relevant to our audiences, including young audiences, because otherwise our viewers will age out and die. And also because public arts funding is easier to argue for if many, many voters love the work and if many, many voters take pride in their local film culture. If the films are relevant, then a great movie, an important movie, a masterpiece, can be a commercial success. And it should be a commercial success. And in fact, it must be a commercial success if we are no longer able, to the same degree, to access public money for funding. I know. Every film we ever made, we wanted to be successful. 
And now I can only speak for the, the countries I know better, but at least in Europe, one downside of selective funding is that the exact same structure that enabled us to develop our craft and to experiment artistically and to grow the careers of filmmakers over time, even when those films weren't always successful with the audience, that exact same freedom came at a cost. The price was that, that we distanced our art form and our industry from the language and from the dreams of many in the audience. I believe that public funding of the arts is central to democracy, but I also believe that the number of films worth making, the number of filmmakers worth supporting will always be greater than the available public funds. So no matter what happens with the public funding, we need to get more proficient in this industry not just as artists, but also as business people. So many of us who are business owners in this field don't have business educations or necessarily even a business mindset. I myself, I was a founding partner in a media production company and now I run two consultancies. My university degree is in literature. And looking at some, at some research from Professor Alessandro Melero, this seems to be true for Brazil as well. Most people who run film companies have learned the business on the job. And that means that we didn't actually learn business principles in general. We learned how to, how to operate a specific type of existing company. And, and we directed our passion and our creativity towards the films themselves, because that's what we care about. We did not direct our creativity towards analyzing the marketplace, identifying opportunities, making innovative business plans, creating profitable partnerships, dreaming up new and better ways of doing the work. Here in Sweden, almost everyone in the culture sector is operating as a small business owner, selling their time. We call ourselves ufrivilliga företagare, non-voluntary entrepreneurs. Because our dream was never to run a business. My company is a legal interface. A company is a legal interface for interacting with the industry, with the banks, with the state. And then if we want to do bigger things, okay, we create bigger companies. But the goal for us often of those companies is still just to allow us more creative control to be able to choose our own colleagues, to make a slightly better living. And as I have talked about today, many of us suffer from this subconscious neurosis that being concerned with profitability somehow compromises our artistic integrity. On the other hand, every filmmaker makes films for a market. Every time we make a film, we adjust to our budgets. We celebrate the creativity from limitations, like this story, you know, the famous story about the film Jaws, that it became so much better because Spielberg couldn't afford the shark. Film people are some of the best problem solvers, some of the most flexible leaders, some of the most practical inventors. We have just never been asked to apply our creative skills to the shape of our industry. So. What we know with certainty is basically this. Going forward, funding and distributing any project requires monetizing audience attention, which requires knowing where that audience is, where their attention is, which requires understanding who they are and speaking to their souls which requires us to listen to their lives, to ensure that our art has relevance, that it has quality, and that it represents our age and our audiences. A central part of early development of any project will be to figure out what format, what platform, what funding model are we working towards this time? And what does that mean for the shape of the thing? especially in the next few years, I think we have to design and run every individual film project as a kind of startup business 
to, to have a real understanding of what need in the world is this particular film fulfilling. And if there's no need for this film, please make another one. <laughs> and the reason I know that this is possible, it's a possible way for us, the reason for this is, is that the audiovisual sector overall is not in crisis. Our problems are largely feature film specific. TV and online and digital games are doing better than ever. So what does it mean for us to be part of and to be seen as part of the audiovisual sector more broadly? What can we learn from the business models of our neighbors, from their ways of working with audiences, with marketing, with distribution, with communities, with managing risks? There are plenty of people last, just like you everywhere in the audiovisual sector, people with your values and people with your dreams. And I think if you find them, there are definitely learning opportunities here and a potential for artistic collaborations and for financing. And just as important is uh, international networking. And I know that, that on production and sales, clearly you, you already do because I can see your films. But at least for me, a positive thing in this last year has been interacting online with colleagues from all over the world, from places that I would not be able to travel to. When we're asking people to think new thoughts, often we say, follow the white rabbit. That is to say, I'm sorry, we don't say follow the right. We should say follow the right rabbits. We say, think outside the box. Hey, think outside the box. What does that even mean? I'm inside a box. How could I think outside it? It's very difficult to reason your way out of a paradigm. What we need is evidence that challenges our understanding of how things work. And that's where the rabbit comes in. We have to look for the things that surprise us. In Alice in Wonderland, Alice sees a rabbit that's looking at its watch. Why does a rabbit have a watch? So she has to follow it to find out. And that's how we end up in unexpected places. So for the final minutes of this talk, I will mention some examples, some new, some old, where I have been surprised by a rabbit with a pocket watch. And we'll start in feature films specifically with two companies from the US that I think are secretly fascinating. The first company is Jason Bloom's production company, Blumhouse Pictures, Paranormal Activity, was their breakthrough film. Now you may remember this film. It was originally made for 15,000 US dollars. And to everyone's surprise, it made $193 million in global box office. In the film industry, uh, when, when we are surprised, we often use the word overperform. And that word means when you see it in the trade papers, it either means we didn't believe in this film, we were wrong, or we underestimated the audience we were wrong. The film doesn't overperform. We are wrong. We in the industry spend a lot of time complaining about what audiences don't do. I think we spend way too little time being curious about why they like what they like. Jason Bloom thought very deeply about the success of this film, and he decided to learn from it, not so much about content, but about risk and reward and creativity. Today, the Blumhouse film method is this. The filmmaker commits to making their film very cheaply, perhaps one million, five million dollars. In exchange, they retain creative control fully. And the more established they are, the more ownership they keep and the bigger cut of the profits. This also applies to the actors who are working far below their normal price code. If the finished film turns out great, they're released widely through the big studios. If they're weaker, they will mostly go online, but they will still break even eventually. As an example, the many sequels of paranormal activity have typically cost between one and five million dollars to make. And all of those films have made more than that amount of money just from the Brazilian box office. I come from a country where five million US dollars is a pretty big budget for a film. So when Bloom says that this is also about the quality of the filmmaking, more money does not equal a better picture. I am very interested, especially because I often hear producers here in Sweden say, oh, we can't compete with blockbuster budgets, therefore we can't reach teenagers. No, clearly someone can with those budgets. 
Also, they have a company culture where the Blumhouse directors help each other out, give each other feedback and so on. And they use a lot of test screenings with the audience to see that the emotions are correct. But the artist still keeps the, the, the final creative control. That's just the input. Making films that will always break even and very often return tenfold or, or hundredfold the money is a pretty good business, but that doesn't mean you have to make populist films. Jordan Peele made Get Out with Blumhouse for four and a half million dollars. Damien Chazelle made Whiplash with them for 3.3. Spike Lee himself made Black Klansman for 15 million. All earned plenty of awards, were very profitable, and they crossed over, speaking to mainstream audiences as well as to the art houses, and not just young viewers, also to 40-somethings like me. Second company. Get Out was distributed in the US by A24, which, is, which was a distributor originally, but now it's also a production company. And it too has in particular succeeded in connecting quality filmmaking with younger and also broader audiences. Most of the films uh, you see here are actually uh, A24 productions. So there are horror titles here, but often they are of an unusual type or of an exceptional quality, such as Ari Aster's films. And in particular, perhaps Robert Eggers' powerful films, The Witch and The Lighthouse. Uh, Robert Eggers is very much an auteur filmmaker. He just realized early on that using some very few elements of genre storytelling would enable him to share this very strange, very beautiful work with a wide audience. A24 have also produced thrillers and dramas by masters like Yorgos Lantimos, the Safdie brothers, and Barry Jenkins, whose A24 film Moonlight won 168 awards, including the Best Picture Oscar. And by the way, Moonlight was made for $1.5 million. A24 started in distribution. And when they got into producing, even producing art house titles, they knew the audience and how to reach it, especially the young under 25s. And in the Nostradamus report, you can read a little bit about a very interesting TikTok phenomenon where young people are developing an interest in art house cinema, specifically presenting themselves as A24 fans. I don't think film companies really used to have fans before, but in a landscape with more film than ever, curation is so important. That's how a producer or even a distributor with a specific voice can become an influencer of behavior in the same way that the local cinemas do so well. It's like a friend recommending you a film. Learning about these A24 fans on TikTok actually helped me solve another mystery. I was astonished and fascinated to see kids on TikTok talking to each other about nuanced differences in profile between art house distribution companies. I had been worried about film education because cinema is a universal language, but we still have to learn it. And film history, we learn by watching films. When I was a kid, I could see classics on TV. Video stores would recommend old films as well as new. Uh, I could read film magazines. I might see classics at, my, at the Cinematheque, retrospectives at film festivals. Uh, if you were a middle-class culture kid in the Nordics back then, probably you even took a few courses of film history at university. Now, almost nothing of this is available now. So how do people learn about film history? This had really worried me. The answer is they teach each other. There is a video essay on YouTube that I really recommend. It's called The Rise of Film TikTok. It explains how TikTok users are teaching each other film storytelling and sharing film tips using visual storytelling methods. They're taking clips from the films that they're talking about and re-editing them and literally even reframing them because the orientation and format of the phone is different. This is the generation that is entering film schools now. It has grown up with a camera constantly in hand, communicating daily through moving images. So, of course, when they teach each other film, it's not in writing that wouldn't be efficient. And in parallel with film TikTok, passionate and knowledgeable YouTube creators with great pedagogical skills, who are typically very good editors, make little mini essays and documentaries teaching or exploring film criticism, film history, the language of cinema itself. You should go take a look at this because it's fun, but also important because this is audience research. 
And of course, these filmmaker communities, film history communities can be ambassadors for your work. Probably also, this is where you're going to hide, find the person that you can hire so that they can market your work to young audiences in the future. Since we're talking about TikTok, uh, so sorry, since we're talking about YouTube, I'd like to mention a slightly older case from the Nostradamus report four or five years ago. It was in, basically about the uh, surprise international success of Turkish TV drama, which was doing really well uh, in many overseas um, markets. The thing that really struck me, though, was the model um, in which production companies put their shows on YouTube just a few hours after they had aired. And a program with 10 million views in broadcast would match 10 million views online, even though there was a lot of ad breaks on, on YouTube. And I was discussing this with this sales agent and, and he suggested, and after that I have heard other people suggest this for other types of content as well, was that for every territory that you don't manage to sell, what if you put your shows, I mean, especially for TV, because it works well with serial, what if you put the shows on YouTube in those territories? Because if you really know who the audience is, you can probably accumulate a significant number of views. Not enough to pay for production, but if that's already covered by local successes and international sales, then that advertising income on top is pure profit. My big takeaway here was actually the way of thinking. Who are we not reaching? Would they love my content? Would they pay for it? Would they want to subscribe to it? Would they watch it for free if it, there was advertising there? Especially with niche or minority audiences in smaller territories, uh, or if the target is, for instance, teenagers, distributors will tell you there is no business there. When a distributor says that, it means they can't make the numbers work for them. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't value that couldn't be exploited, even alone, uh, certainly with the right partner. In this last year, my biggest media surprise has been the following. You may know it from the picture. Many of my friends in the Nordic countries, mostly women, have become obsessed with a Chinese TV drama called The Untamed. It's very complicated, incomprehensible, I feel, if you don't have the Chinese cultural context, and we totally don't. But it's romantic and exciting, and there is something about how difficult it is and how different the storytelling is that makes these people love it more. I've never seen such obsession among grown-ups for a TV show. Literally, I know three different people now who are learning the Chinese language because of their passion for this specific TV adventure. Now, from the outside, it looked to me like a new generation of Brazilian filmmakers were really hitting their stride, just that everything shut down for you and, and the cinemas shut down everywhere. We don't know how you would have normally done in the global market in the last two years, but clearly the depth and diversity of the filmmaking that you already have and your international present uh, and the, the benefit of potentially enormous domestic audiences to means I think you can do enormously well. My country, Finland, is 10 years behind the other Nordics in the success of our films internationally, and even that's getting better. But when I despair, I always remind myself, Iceland, even Iceland is exporting film. Their population is 350,000. You can do it. As a strategic consultant, with a background in both design processes and in the humanities, I am allergic to, faces, to phrases like it's impossible or it could never work or some group of people, X will never do Y. Uh, like, we will never get young people to see art house film. No, that is not how reality works. We are constantly surprised by life. Very few things are impossible. The right question, the right question to ask is what would it take? And sometimes what it would take is not worth the effort or it would take too long or maybe it wouldn't be ethical. Okay, great. Some things that are possible are not worth doing, then maybe do something else. But very often when we call something impossible, what we mean is it's not possible for me to do in my current position. But in that case, if I just find new partners, that could change my agency radically. So my final example today, I learned of this year, maybe you already know it, but it was a big surprise for me. 
because I have always thought that the one thing that is almost impossible for any of us to change is the presence of US blockbuster films in our cinemas. So earlier this year, I participated as a speaker in an online workshop for film fund professionals from, from different countries. And the lady from, I think, the Philippine Film Agency, she told us something so shocking that I forgot to write her name down, I'm sorry. Uh, but I looked up the thing that she was talking about on Wikipedia later, and I'm not making this up. Since the 1970s in the Philippines, the Metro Manila Film Festival, which is now a, ma a national event, has been a platform for domestic films to compete for awards. For one week in December, I think it's Christmas to New Year, a big holiday, holiday week uh, in the cinemas. But during this festival week, only domestic Philippine films are screened in cinemas. Marvel films and Disney films go on a break just for that one week. And she said that what often happens is the most commercial films in the competition do best at first, but then when the awards show happens a few days in, the winners are often slightly more specialized. And then of course their box office goes up and so on. And we were astonished. We asked her, but how is this possible given the power of, of the US studios? And she said, well, when this was invented, we were in a dictatorship. But also, honestly, what are they going to do? If you want to be in this market, these are the rules. Uh, and actually, in 2017, a second Filipino film festival, which I think has a more art house focus, was introduced in August with similar, similar rules. So it turns out that carving out space for domestic film in the holiday season wasn't impossible. What would it take? What would it take? Well, in this case, the state, the exhibitors, and the industry identified a model where everybody wins. And it became an event. And people are suddenly invested in their local cinema culture. And going out for a film or two that week becomes a family tradition. And these are broadly appealing films, so the cinemas are full. And by the way, the exhibitors are fine, because the people who love The Fast and the Furious, they will be back the following week. Because they want to see that as well. It's natural to be afraid of structural and technological changes or, or even paralyzed by that fear. We, we, can, we can feel those feelings and then we have to move on. For 100 years in this industry, we have told ourselves a story about constant crisis, about external forces getting in the way of our work. And yeah, you know what? We will continue in crisis thanks to the climate situation alone. Even if we manage to bring back public film funding and to protect it for the future, a constant crisis is not a story. How about we tell this one instead? We as an industry are flexible and innovative. There is greater demand than ever in history for our skills and our vision. Filmmaking is democratizing and growing. Value chains to distribution and consumption are bigger than ever before. And we, with our skills of production and filmmaking, and also our deep connection to the language and the history of cinema, we can be part of shaping that broad landscape for the better, artistically, ethically, sustainably. Instead of telling ourselves that we are in crisis, let's say that we are learning from each other, internationally and between generations and between the different facets of the audiovisual industries. As we look for solutions going forward, let's look for those win-win scenarios. And above all, let's understand that we are no longer competing for crumbs inside our own countries. We are all collaborating as colleagues, making film, meaningful qualitative film for all kinds of people in an endless international market. So I will end on a series of questions that I ask you to, to consider most seriously. What if the traditional film industry is gone? What if we had to invent it from scratch today? What stories would feel most urgent to tell? What images would feel most urgent to share? What cameras would we use? What editing equipment? How would we organize our creative collaborations? What do the audiences yearn for? And who would those audiences be? What would it take to fill one single screening with people who haven't been to the cinema in three years? 
And if you can do that once, could you do it again 500 times? What would it take to get something you made in front of 2 million people online? What about 20 million? How would we develop projects to be able to prove to our partners that the audience cares? How would we budget? How would we organize ownership to be able to be profitable? What would we do if we had to start over? And on the other hand, this. What in the traditional film industry still works? First on a structural level. What kinds of audiovisual storytelling is getting funded and seen? Where is the qualitatively best content that also has a large and diverse audience? What collaborations or companies actually function even now? Can you think of any cultural production anywhere that you actually respect, you personally, that is currently also profitable? And what can you learn from that? And then we must ask, ask ourselves personally, what in this industry, in my work, do I still love? What gives me energy? What moments in my day or what elements of the filmmaking process make me excited and proud and creative and focused? Find 10 things or even just one thing that you genuinely want to be doing. Because if we have to reinvent how we make films, and what we do day to day, we have to ask ourselves why we make films and make especially sure to keep those activities that keep us happy. What is my artistic voice? What is my social goal? What is my joy? What is my joy? These are the important things. Everything else about how we work can change, but if we have to reinvent ourselves as an industry to survive, and if, if we have to entirely reinvent our relationship to the audience, we have to understand ourselves. In the Nostradamus uh, project this spring, we ran a future-oriented business development course uh, for regional film industry companies. And we talked about strategy and streamers and all that. And at the end of the course, we realized that all of this hard data boils down to these five questions. What is a sustainable business for me in film? What do I need to know to be certain my analysis of that is correct? What steps would I need to take to get to that place that I just imagined? What would I need to learn? And most importantly, who would I need to be standing next to? Who are my partners? Who are my mentors? Who do I train? Who has the same goals but different resources? Where are the win-win scenarios? Where can small stakeholders make big change together? This year's Nostradamus uh, report is called Transforming Storytelling Together. Transforming Storytelling Together. And that word storytelling is there because we only exist when stories get told and heard and shared. The realities of the world affect us and we affect the world. For this, we are responsible together. We will create new models for funding and distribution together. Together, we will identify the new artistic languages enabled by new production methods, by new media, and by new distribution platforms. Virtual production will empower us to work remotely together. International co-production will get stronger because of that. And of course, also, we will have much deeper creative collaboration between the department heads on our film locally. And only by working together in our countries, internationally, and between the different fields inside the audiovisual sector, can we use this moment to shape our film industry into a sustainable industry to remain in and to thrive in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna, for this scenario, for this worried Thank but so challenged much. landscape you, you talk about. And Thank we you. have some questions. We have time for questions. I don't know. Uh, se as pessoas que estiverem me ouvindo na audiência 
quiserem é, se manifestar, a gente está um pouco no, no teto do, 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 daqui da, da, do espaço do, dessa sala, mas ainda há tempo para algumas perguntas. É, enquanto, enquanto as pessoas se manifestam, é, ou pensam ou, ou elaboram alguma questão, eu, eu queria é, eu formular né, uma pergunta baseada na tua fala, Johanna, que em muitos momentos né, a sua aproximação é, ao, ao traçar esse cenário, né, você passou por, pela questão da sustentabilidade, do meio ambiente, do financiamento, da tecnologia, da história, é, da estética... E em, em, em to, quase todos esses momentos, é, teve uma palavra é, que, que se repetiu né, ao longo da, dessa, dessa uma hora e quarenta minutos, que foi a palavra audiência. Né? Quando você fala é, em, em, em hum. novos modelos de negócio, né, esse, esse mercado paralelo, quando você fala nesse modelo creator o consumer, quando você fala que nós deveríamos investir mais é, em, em obras voltadas para a audiência, trabalhar mais junto a essa audiência, né? together. É, eu, eu fico me perguntando e também, uhum. claro, né, tomando esse Nostradamus Report como é, um, um ponto de partida para todas essas reflexões, uma plataforma onde todos os anos você revê essas reflexões, e essas mudanças de paradigma, nós estamos fazendo as perguntas certas sobre as audiências, nós estamos formulando pesquisas, boas pesquisas, sejam elas acadêmicas ou de mercado, a respeito das, das audiências? Hum. Yeah, I don't think we are. Um, to be honest, I, I, but I also think we get confused. Often we think that the audience, I have to know about all the audience, you know, or I, I, I can't ever know about the audience because Netflix will not give me my numbers, you know. And, and again, as I said, that's super annoying and we should fight that. But often qualitative data is, is also data, you know, um, and, and knowing very clearly what the themes of your work is and, and who you're working with and and being daring to to speak to people about this and listen in on people um, when they talk about those things and finding the relevance in, in people's lives i think it will surprise you often or I, we know that it will surprise you uh, to figure out how big an audience is instead of saying oh but like we have these demographics who go to the cinema you know, and then we, you know, or I want to tell this story. What if we said, okay, but I'm going to tell this story about these themes. For who in society are these themes relevant? And maybe think about what are those people's lives like and how do I get my work in front of them? In, instead, first, instead of saying, I have to finance in this one way, I have to convince the financiers that this is an important topic. I'm going to tell stories to a financer about some people over here. They're never going to see the film because they're not in our ecosystem. You know, it feels backwards when you think about it. If we started to make film today, I don't think this is how we, we would work. Surely we would think, I need, I desperately need to tell this important story or this fun, entertaining story. Who loves it? How, where are they? And then work backwards from that. Uh, I think that that would be natural. And that's kind of what you do in any other business as well. <laughs> Who needs this, you ask? And then you figure out how to do that. Yeah, great. Não, foi ótimo, acho que esse, esses exemplos que você trouxe né, ilustram bem essa ideia né, do, do, do Turkish drama ou do Danish drama, é, como, como eles circulam e como eles apelam, né, como eles é, é, estimulam esse gosto do, é, de, de audiências estrangeiras. Vamos chegar aqui. Nós não temos até agora nenhuma questão. É... Maybe everybody fell asleep. I've never spoken so slowly in my life, I feel. So. <laughs> não foi ótima a tradução, foi, foi, foi muito boa. But then I will say it again, just emphasize that I, I think the more I think about this, you know, if I can figure out how do I make 
you know, like if, if I, I'm invested, of course, in author film, I think, you know, or, or feel creative film collectives, it doesn't have to be an individual, but to make like the best movie in the world and to find the 23 year olds who love that, like that, that challenge, I think that would be interesting. And the shortcut to do that, if you're a producer is you find a 28 year old filmmaker who is really good because they can speak to the 20, 23 year olds. But if, you know, if you're 43 or 63, I believe you can speak to 23 year olds also, but then you kind of have to know some 23 year olds and you also have to listen to some of them. <laughs> that's, a, that's a requirement, but that's how we save cinema. It's not to keep fighting these old dragons. We have to build new audiences. That is how we say, save cinema. And we, if we genuinely believe that it's worth saving, like we say all these things, it's so important, you know, and it's important for democracy and the people has a right to cinema. Okay, you know what, let's put our money where our mouth is, or let's put our art where our mouth is. Then let's make some film for the people that is worth seeing that people care about, you know. <laughs> E, e você poderia dar, é, falar um pouco, né, quando você fala na diversificação, na necessidade, né, na urgência de, de diversificação de linguagens, de formatos, que exemplos você traria dos países nórdicos é, que são bons cases? Ah. No, I, yeah, okay. I, I think I think I understand. I, I also laugh because um, I th the Nordic countries are very traditional. Our industries are very traditional in some ways. So we are struggling with this so much. Um, but I, I think, you know, and, and we believe when we think about diversity, we are only thinking about how do we, in, the, in, in our country, it's very like brutally. First, it was how do we make sure that women can make film we're getting better, especially in Sweden, but that's still a struggle. How and now it's how, you know everybody who isn't white. <laughs> it's unacceptable the 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 small percentage of people who are who are allowed to make cinema, even you know in our countries as well. Um, but I think that's also a very narrow view of diversity that we also have this this question. Uh, Again, if you think about it from the perspective of the audience, we think about cinema as a completely separate um, art form. But, you know, film is here and film is in my living room. And, and if people who watch film on television, that's part of a media flow with many different kinds of audiovisual storytelling. People who watch films, I wish they didn't, but you know, they do, we have to accept it. People who watch film on their device, on their tiny devices, um, that's also in a flow of, of formats. And the audience is very good, especially the younger audience, is at optimizing their experience. They feel some, for me right now today, the best content is this kind of format, this kind of story, this kind of platform. And they transform the same devices or the same spaces can transform and tell many different types of, of formats. And increasingly even cinemas are showing, you know, other kinds of content as well. So the, the, the platform does not determine the format. The user determines, you know, the story determines the format and the audience and everything in between. You know, we just have to figure out the money flow because there, there is an audience need and there is a story need and those two we can connect. And that diversity also matters, not just themes, not just on-screen representation, behind the camera representation, but of course those are completely necessary for, for reaching all audiences. Bom, é, eu espero que essa, esse processo né, de você se, se preparar para essa fala de hoje e, e, e se deparar com, com a experiência que, vivida pelo Brasil agora, né, nesse esse, esse, esse momento político, esse momento de crise ambiental, de pandemia, enfim, que isso possa de alguma maneira também enriquecer o teu trabalho e o teu relatório do próximo ano. E queria deixar aqui essa janela aberta para que a gente possa continuar esse trabalho em parceria, together, né? é, principalmente através do que você vem fazendo do, do Nostradamus Academia. Eu acho que é uma experiência fantástica e que, que merece, é, é, a gente merece criar essa ponte entre, entre os países. De novo, queria te agradecer, Johanna. Thank you. I, I want to say that 
You know, I said at the start, I, I really genuinely believe that you are, you will be the pioneers. You know, people give talks and they say polite things. This is not a polite thing. You are forced, you are forced to find solutions. Yeah. Some people will, will, can, will not be able to, some people will switch industries. They will be too tired. I, I respect that. That's okay. But some people, new people will come in and some people will be able to find ways. And we're all looking to you, you know find ways and test things and sometimes when we test things we will fail that's okay <laughs> you know but share your results be in international spaces and tell us about what you're doing uh, because I think we all need to learn and and I'd be very very happy to listen anytime thank you so much for inviting me thank you so much for your questions <laughs> more than answers thank you <laughs>